Hello, everybody, and welcome to another Desk Side Talk with Mark. I'm just going to be talking today about a couple of things that have come up in the board game world and a little bit about what I've been playing recently. I did get to play Twilight Imperium 4th Edition. We talked about it a bit on the end of the year podcast for 2017. I said it was the game I most wanted to play of the games that I needed to play, which that list has somehow gotten longer as I've played more games. I think I've found other games that I still need to play, but I've got a giant list here on my whiteboard that I still need to get through, but I did, I I was able to get through Twilight Imperium 4th Edition once more. I don't know if I'll be writing a review of it because basically it's just a marginal improvement on the 3rd Edition. It does not change enough, I think, to be a radical enough departure from the third game to warrant a whole new review. So I guess I might consider writing a a review going over the changes in more detail, but consider this for now. My review is that I think it it is, at least after one play, I think it is an improvement on the third edition. It has better minis. The plastic is better in there. The graphic design is better. The technology tree is more streamlined and I think you get more interesting techs with each advance or more interesting abilities even though largely overall the abilities available are are more or less the same each individual one I think has been tweaked a bit to to make them more interesting as you try to move up the tech tree to things that you want to get at higher levels So I think that's been improved significantly. I like the way they're doing politics, which is the other big change where once someone hits Mechatol Rex in the middle of the board, uh, after each round, there are two politics phases where people vote on two laws. So it's not tied to a strategy card anymore. It is, in fact, part of the game, but only once you get past kind of the early stages of the game, which I think is interesting, and it did result in some really fun political rounds. So I do like that improvement. The one thing I'm not completely sold on after one play is the trading system. In every other aspect of the game, they've streamlined and made more clear the game, except I think in trading, where now you have these various cards. You start out with four, I think, and maybe there's a racial one, so five at the end of the day, that promise different things. So, for instance, you can have a ceasefire where there's some incentive not to attack the other person. You can give out, like, a temporary victory point that can disincentivize someone else from attacking you. You can essentially get trade goods like you could before, although there's a little system involved there with, like, these kind of benign goods that you generate that don't have any value until you trade them away. The cards, I think it's a good idea in theory. The cards are worded a bit awkwardly, just in the way they have to be worded to be traded about. And I don't think the payoff is necessarily worth it, but I got to play with it more, see if it can be manipulated more interestingly than we used it in the one game. But at the end of the day, if you... If you're in love with Twilight Imperium and you already have the 3rd edition, if it's not going to hurt your wallet too much, I do recommend the 4th edition as an upgrade. But I think if you have the 3rd edition and you enjoy it, you shouldn't be afraid that you're missing out on something spectacular if you don't get the 4th edition. It's a modest improvement with a bit better production values and some streamlining, which cut our game down to only like seven, seven and a half hours, which is the fastest game of Twilight Imperium we've ever played. But it's not a radical improvement on the game. It's a good game. It's a good improvement. Glad I got it. Glad that it's quicker. And the the weird thing is that I don't exactly know why the game is quicker because all the improve. I think it's just the culmination of all the small improvements with graphic design and with some of the systems in the game that add up to this large reduction in playtime, which is really remarkable. Like I said, we played in seven hours, and usually our games take easily ten hours. So I was impressed that we were able to get through it that quickly, and it's just an easier experience to grasp now in the fourth edition. But, like I said, nothing major that you're missing if 
you stick with Twilight Imperium 3rd Edition. Speaking of graphic design, one of the interesting things I saw on the internet this week was in regards to the Hawaii panic that happened where people got a a message, an emergency message that said that a ballistic missile was coming and that it was not a test and that they needed to prepare. And obviously that caused a lot of panic and it was not true. And it came out in an investigation that the system that they used for test alerts was a drop down box where the test missile defense alert button was directly above the actual missile defense alert button. So the person just misclicked on the wrong one because they were right next to each other. And I think that's a really clear example of why design, graphic design, interface design matters so much. And it's one of the things I want to learn more about because I don't, I, I appreciate it and I understand that it's so important, like in this kind of example. And I think I can, I notice pretty well when games have excellent design in that sense, but I want to learn more about it so I can, so I can understand it more so I can recognize it better in board games <laughs> because certain games can become so much more simple just from a change in the graphic design. Twilight Imperium, just what I was talking about is an example. I think something like Venus has really clear graphic design where it could be, it could be a lot muddier aren't a lot of examples that are coming to my head, but it's something that I, I want to pick up and notice more as I play games, and it's something that really interests me. Another big news item from the board game world this week was an interview with, I believe Christian Peterson from Fantasy Flight. It was two people from Fantasy Flight, uh, or Asmodee North America, as they're called, and they were talking about the piracy problem. And it's something I've been, I've known about a bit just through reading about board games that People have been buying stuff really cheap from Amazon, buying board games very cheap from Amazon, and then they notice that they're actually not legit games, they're copies. And it's something that has been popping up, and this interview blew my mind because they said for certain games, they think in the last year, I believe, for certain games, presumably really popular games, I, I, I know Seven Wonders is one I kept seeing a lot because it's a popular game and presumably a lot easier to make because it's almost entirely cards. But anyway, they said for certain games in the last year or two, they estimate that up to 70% of all sold copies were fakes, which blew my mind. I had no idea the problem is that big. So it'll be interesting to see what companies do do about it to try to stop this, but it's, it's certainly something that you should be aware of, particularly when buying through Amazon, because even if it's fulfilled by Amazon, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be legit. So my rule of thumb is on Amazon, if the price seems too good to be true, it probably is. Amazon prices should not, typically do not differ that much from retailers like Cool Stuff. So if there's a price that's substantially lower on Amazon, I would steer clear of it because I think it's 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 a much more substantial problem than I realize. And from a legal standpoint, it's a very difficult thing to work with legally. Like, how do you sue someone? Like, there the presumably are fairly small time operations that can bounce around between people. It's hard to, from a business standpoint, I think to do anything significant about it. So the most significant thing that can be done is just being careful when you buy games. And I'm all for searching out for great deals, but you know, there's not that big of a margin, I think, in the board game world. So if a deal seems too good to be true from Amazon, I would stay away from it or be cautious about it. The final big topic of the board gaming world this week is the new Cool Mini or Not game that came out on Kickstarter called Hate in, I believe, officially in all capital letters, which is based on some kind of comic by one of the artists at, at Simon, and it was released with this trailer video that I couldn't even get through. I got through maybe half of it. It was so dumb and so stupidly gratuitous that it seemed like a joke. Basically, it was your typical announcer talking about the game with very, very poorly executed cussing. Like, it, it's, 
it's one of the most awkward things I've ever seen. From what I can gather about the game, it's just embracing every horrible, violent, science fiction, fantasy trope ever. I think it's some kind of sci-fi post-apocalyptic world where, for some reason, everyone just wants to murder and rape each other. And they're selling the board game on this. Now, in, in Simon's favor, they're clearly marking that this is a mature game, 18 years old and above and all that. And they're only selling it exclusively on Kickstarter, so it won't be on any family, you know, family store, board game store shelves. But there's been a, a fair amount of discussion about it online. And I'm going to stay away from talking about the game, but I, because to me it's just unremarkable. It's a silly, dumb-looking game that seems to be marketed towards teenagers who think they're really cool. And in most of what I would say is just that I think it's a dumb idea. It's obviously, it's made them tons of money already. It, within, I think, 15 minutes, it made a quarter of a million dollars on Kickstarter. But a lot of the discussion I've seen about it is is so half-baked and, in some cases, just incomprehensible to me that I want to talk about how we talk about things online. The discussions I'm seeing online are people get getting upset or just saying, I think rightly, that this was a bad idea on, on Simon's part. And other people jumping in and say, oh, freedom of speech, we shouldn't censor them, uh, they have the right to, to make this game. And those two arguments don't connect with each other. They're saying different things. For someone to respond with censorship or freedom of speech responses, the argument presented to them needs to be that game should be illegal to make, or the government should stop them from making that game. Saying, I don't think that game should be made, or that Simon shouldn't have made the game, is not a freedom of speech argument. Freedom of speech is stopping the government from prohibiting freedom of speech. And just on a fundamental level, I see this kind of disconnect between arguments in discussion online all the time, and it, it completely baffles me. I don't understand how people are not understanding the assumptions behind their arguments. On the other hand, if people honestly think that there is a freedom of speech or censorship issue about saying this person or this company should not do that, what they're saying is that fundamentally, the argument that someone or a company should not do something is an invalid statement. They're, they're arguing against an ought statement, a normative statement entirely. Now, that's something you could argue, but I highly doubt that that's what the people are talking about. There's a lot of underlying assumptions that I think are going unsaid, and because they're going unsaid, everyone's talking past each other. I think the discussions that are happening around this game are fascinating precisely because they're so incoherent in that if we're going to have any value in discussing something online or on social media or whatever, and maybe that's impossible to do, that is entirely likely, then we need to understand the presuppositions and the assumptions that are coming with statements instead of just latching on to the strongest language possible. The problem is that the medium of social media rewards people who use incredibly strong language. It does not reward people who use moderate language or who try to create a robust dialogue, usually. And so if social media and if the internet is going to be even a moderately decent avenue for discussion, people need to change the way the incentives work. I don't know if you can do that structurally, but what you can do is just stop supporting really radical statements that don't, that just shout, that don't try to actually engage or say anything about the topic they're talking about. And until that happens, it's just going to be a complete mess of people talking past each other like we see here. I honestly do not understand most of the things I've read about hate, like they don't make any sense to me because I don't understand the assumptions behind them. They seem to be assuming one thing, but they're saying something else. 
And I think it's because people have a very hard time making moral arguments. And granted, making moral arguments is difficult, but the argument tends to come down to this idea of censorship or freedom of speech or an idea that we can't make any moral statements whatsoever. And I think that's a hard position to take, and I think it's something that people don't actually believe. Anyway, I don't care about the game that much. I have no interest in playing it, and I'm sure it'll fade out of the news cycle, but I think there's something to be learned from the way it's being talked about online, just in, in the way we make moral arguments and the way we discuss things online. Anyway, that's it for my thoughts on this week's board game topics. Don't forget to check out thethoughtfulgamer.com. Check out The Thoughtful Gamer on Twitter and Facebook. And if you enjoyed this podcast, check out our Patreon page where every single dollar will help keep this going and keep me in the black for 2018. I'll talk to you all again soon. Goodbye. Goodbye.